Good evening and welcome everybody to the Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Board of Trustees meeting. Today's date is Tuesday, April 4th. I'd like to call in order. Mr. Kaley. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson here. Mr. Quadro. Present. And Mayor Sierra is expected. Julie, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Parker, we do a mission statement. Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public tonight? Nope. Hearing none. <laughs> participation by the trustees? No. Rick? No, sir. Okay. I'm going to read into new business. The FY24 budget presentation. Good evening, everybody. So I will take the liberty, unless anybody wants me to review. Basically, the first two thirds of this presentation is what we reviewed at the last meeting. Uh, I'd just like to have that in the official packet. Uh, but if there were any questions that we did not discuss, but I think we know who the trustees are, the administrative team, mission statement. We went through all the student demographics last meeting, and none of this has changed. Uh, post grad plans, the comparison between Smith Vocational and the other Western Mass Regional Vote Techs, the enrollment projections over the next three years. And again, just as a reminder, sort of plant a seed as we really get into the budget. I just want to highlight the fact again, uh, this coming year we are anticipating another bump, uh, approximately 20 additional students. Uh, not all 20 students will be non-resident students, which we again alluded to last meeting. Uh, it's the non-resident students and that non-resident tuition rate which really drives the budget and again we'll, we'll revisit that this evening. Uh, the following year we do anticipate another bump of approximately 15 students. Uh, is at that point we will hit the, the alleged capacity of 600 students. Uh, that's per the admissions policy. And then after that, we'll be sort of status quo. You know, that flat line, uh, if and when, until the day ever comes if we decide to, to increase that enrollment project, uh, expectation or not. Uh, but again, we'll have two more bumps and then we level up. And again, we're looking at the historical enrollment, talking about the vision of where we want to be in the next several years. And then we got into the admission sort of Again, talking about that philosophical debate around what is our capacity, what should it be, and you know, potentially what the 600 students look like on campus, and uh, you know, that 720, as a reminder, would be if we filled every single slot in all 15 of our, of our programs, it would take 720 students. It, is that honestly feasible at this point? And the short answer is no. Uh, we don't have enough academic teachers to teach the 720 students, and more importantly, even if we had the teachers, there's no place for those teachers to teach. Uh, so then we have to have a, a discussion around space. Uh, this was the admissions data uh, from DESE. And this is the current freshman class uh, looking at the Northampton residents. You know, you know, and we talked about that and what that looks like. And we got into sort of our vision around curriculum instruction, looking at animal science, expanding animal science. Uh, the last component uh, down here talking about horticulture. Just as a heads up, um, Thursday morning I'll be down at FFA for the awards program that all of you are invited to. Uh, I'll be participating in a department of ed uh, meeting around two talks. One is horticulture, and specifically this topic. Uh, looking at the concentrations within horticulture, do they want to break them out, create sort of their own sub-programs, kind of like what they've begun to do in animal science with, with the vet assisting program. Uh, so that discussion is going to begin. And then the second topic, Thursday morning, will be an update on the hoisting license saga uh, statewide. Are there um, vocational schools that have horticulture programs that aren't agricultural schools? Yes. Most, most vocational schools will have a, a horticulture program. Okay. Thank you. The question is, uh, the analogy the Department of Ed uses is uh, 
Grass, flowers, trees. Grass, flowers, trees. Uh, do you focus on grass, which is the turf management aspect, landscape design aspect, uh, the trees, which is the arboriculture, or flowers being the greenhouse management? Uh, again, very broad, very basic analogy. Uh, but the question is, a lot of families, uh, if, if families want to have their child study trees, uh, they think about Smith, because we have what we call, honestly, I think a lot of us call the horticulture program here at Smith the forestry program. Forestry is not the program. Forestry is a concentration within the horticulture program. So a lot of students may want to have that horticulture experience, but because it's technically horticulture, and if you live in Munson, as an example, okay, my son lives in Munson, if you want to pursue uh, horticulture, you would have to go to Pathfinder because Pathfinder offers horticulture, even though Pathfinder doesn't really have a strong concentration in arboriculture. Uh, that's just how it is. So that's sort of the debate. Okay. Staffing focus. Again, we're talking about all of the increases that we've had over the last few years when it comes to uh, the staffing areas. You know, we'll, we'll get into what we're looking at within the budget. And then, again, all of the capital facility improvements that we've had over the last several years. This is a reminder of all the great work that's been happening. It's very easy to, to not forget about it, but it sort of becomes the new norm, and you forget, wow, yeah, we've done a lot over the last few years. So it's nice to, to review. And then, again, it was just a looking at the animal science complex and the renovations and the vision around that. And timelines, talking about the, the horticulture building, financially where we sit with that. And if there's any tie back into building the budget this year, keeping in mind that we'll have this major building project. Uh, just things to think about as we build the budget. And again, as a reminder, all the skills capital grants that we received uh, this past year, uh, totaling $7.7 million. So let's get into the budget. <clears throat> so you saw most of these slides, but there are some updates. Uh, some good news, honestly. Uh, the, the good news came in late yesterday afternoon. Uh, that the Department of Ed did unveil the official non-resident tuition rate. So the number I gave you at the last meeting was the unofficial, it was sort of that early projection from, from the department. Uh, they came out with the official rate, and that official number is $20,076. So it did go up slightly. It's an increase of 2.31% over the current non-resident tuition rate. Was it 1.75%? Somewhere in that range, correct. Uh, we were using 19,900 and some change was the previous tuition rate that we were building the draft budget on. So now we've we cracked the 20,000 mark. Overall, when you now look at the, the overall budget, and again, this includes all of the revenue sources that we use in, in building the budget. It's not necessarily only the units number, uh, but we look at a grand total of 13,488,000 $374. That's an increase of $692,483, which is a 5.41% increase over this current fiscal year. Now, this number, compared to last week or the last meeting, whatever we met last, that's an increase of $68,975. So, we, in essence, we had an additional almost $69,000 to <coughs> place back into the budget and then decide as, as an admin team how are we going to not budget that money. Yeah, that's going to be the discussion tonight. That's a good problem. It is, yes. So this is a new, a new slide that we put in uh, for this evening. I know you can't see most of these, but I love how the mayor uses the pie chart, so I just probably got it here. It's beautiful. <laughs> color. But again, if, when you, once you get the printout version, I, I know I shared it with all of you an electronic file. If you had a chance today to look at it, but just a couple quick themes. This biggest chunk, just like a city or a town's budget, the vast majority of the budget goes to the schools. Uh, when you look at a particular school's budget, the biggest slice of the pie are the teachers. Uh, so that, that's nothing new. But I, I just want to highlight to the board, yet what I did, these are all the subcategories. And when we go through the budget, you'll see there's many, many sections basically and I wanted to have it subdivided by the section. I know when Crystal works with the department there's much fewer cost centers uh, but I really wanted to break it out and just give the board a, a better idea of what we're looking at. The top seven slices and it goes largest all the way to the smallest. Okay that's how it's been sorted. The top seven slices 
all pertain to some level, to some capacity, people. Okay? Uh, the first non-personnel slice of the pie happens to be instructional materials, which I would argue is a good thing. Okay? We want to make sure that we have supplying material in front of the teachers so they can teach the students, especially at a vocational school. But unfortunately, that only equates to about 2.7% of the overall budget. Okay? And that's, I'm talking this slice right here. That's the first slice that does not pertain to staffing. But then once you get beyond that slice, you get back into staffing. The business and finance, uh, the superintendent guidance, okay? And then we get into a lot of the maintenance of the building with utilities and whatnot. So the point is, personnel equates to a much higher than simply 43% of the overall budget. It's probably well over 50%, okay? Ken, are you going to read through those topics? Those six after teachers? I was going to rattle off the, the biggest increases and decreases, but no, I can definitely, I think I can read them here. Maybe easier on my printout. So, just so you know, that the largest slice again is teacher salary. Then you move into custodial, is number two. Oh. Now, custodial is not only their, their actual salaries, but we have to uh, account for overtime. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Once we get into the budget, we, when we get to that subcategory, you'll see all the lines that constitute that custodial slice of the pie. Then we have the principal. But again, that's not Mr. Bianca's salary, okay? Uh, that includes, uh, again, I am advocating for a second assistant principal. So in there are two assistant principals. It's the two front office secretaries. It's the <coughs> director of security. It's our behavioral specialist. <coughs> and it's a lot of other non-personnel line items that Mr. Bianco oversees. Uh, then we get into the teacher specialists. Then um, SPED admin. Are those um, like, like uh, SLP? I'm trying to that subcategory. I'd have to. I'd have to see what. It, yeah. Once we get to the budget. Okay. Be my but okay. highlight that one. Yeah. Uh, then SPED admin. Then guidance and social work, and then athletics. Those are the top. Six. So again, athletics. There's a lot of non-personnel. But you're talking about all your coaching stipends. Obviously, uh, Mr. LaRoe, who you've met, he's, you know, half-time, not half-time, but 50% is athletic director, 50% is a co-op coordinator, yeah. so that 50% of the salary does fall under the athletic because his AD uh, staff part of the salary. Okay. And then instructional materials, and uh, so on and so forth. <coughs> So in the past, I used to sort of highlight most of these cost subcategories and, and had a, uh, a comparison from the previous year. You know, what did it go up, what did it go down? I just wanted to showcase the top five. So the top five reductions. <clears throat> so actually uh, lowering the, the budgeted amount from the current fiscal year to the, to the next year. And the biggest one is taking <coughs> out the employee separation. Okay. It, we just zeroed it out. So right now there is no budget. That's why it's dropped 100%. Uh, it's a reduction of uh, just over $12,000. Why do we do that? Uh, right now we are not planning on uh, any retirement buyout, uh, which is either sick time, vacation time, so on and so forth. So right now we're not projecting any of those uh, buyout benefits for any employees leaving. Other district admin, we're dropping that by uh, 28,000. That's a 43% drop in that particular line. And uh, that would be the big discussion. That is because I am recommending that we do not fill the grant writer position. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail. So that's, that's the reduction there. Then other instructional expenses, a reduction of about 24%. That equates to about $5,000 in that particular line. And uh, that is looking at actual licenses and testing for students and staff. So in many of our vocational areas, students are able to earn various professional licenses and oftentimes will pay for that first license. Uh, also on the staff side, uh, some of the stipulations for employment, as an example, if you're a plumbing instructor, you have to keep maintain your plumbing license and we, and we keep that license up for the staff as well. Uh, so there's a slight reduction in that and that's not because we're gonna offer less, uh, it's just actually looking at the actual expenses and sometimes these te the tests and the licenses, they're not every single year. So it's sort of a cycle. Uh, so some years it's an increase, some years it's a decrease. 
uh, this year is a decrease. So it wasn't that we're trying to save money and we're cutting back on, on students and staff. This is one of those years. Then instructional software, it's a reduction of $5,000. Uh, it's about 11% uh, decrease. Uh, and that's just looking at general software licenses across the campus. And, and oftentimes that's a similar cycle where uh, Mr. Shear, the IT director, he maintains this massive spreadsheet. It's very impressive to look at. Uh, but some of those licenses aren't up every single year. And it's just a cycle that we have. About how much do we spend on instructional software? Yeah. I'm just curious. I didn't know the five thousand was like eleven percent of the total, eleven percent reduction from the previous year. Right. So it's a reduction of eleven percent. So yeah. add that back in. Because so I'm sure that's replaced textbooks. So in the budget. And the last one is. So this is for yeah. 88,000. The last one I, I listed as copiers. Again, that's a reduction of 5,000. That's about a 10% reduction in that particular category. And it's not that we're getting rid of copiers necessarily. It's part of the overall school contract that we have. But specifically, this specific savings is that in this particular line, uh, we were paying for a copier in the graphic arts department. We were able to pay that, that copier off finally, so that, that's no longer a bill. So we are able to save that $5,000. So when you rank by the largest percent cuts, those are your top five in the budget. Now let's reverse that discussion, the five largest increases in the budget. Uh, and, and topping the list, again, it's not that Mr. Bianca is getting that kind of a pay raise, okay? That's his category. And specifically, uh, because we're advocating for the second assistant principal. Uh, so we budgeted that salary in there. Uh, another one is, uh, within that particular one, is convocation. That's the first day back for all staff. Uh, it's a, a relatively large assembly kickoff event for our staff. We try to provide food for them. And uh, we haven't been properly budgeting that over the last several years. So again, just trying to be as transparent as possible and making sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, and we've increased that particular line. So. Uh, overall, it's about a 33.69% increase, uh, but again, it's not just one salary. It's many things in that particular category. HR sees a 24% increase. That's a $17,247 increase, and that's uh, with our new HR coordinator, uh, sort of that transition. Uh, so, but we're not looking at adding anybody or anything like that. It's just now with the new person on board for the full budget cycle, that's what we're looking at. Last meeting, we already talked about utilities. Uh, so unfortunately for us, utilities is number three in a budget increase, of about a 21% increase. That's in dollars and cents, that's 49,520 additional dollars that we're budgeting for utilities. Textbooks, we're looking at right now a 17.9% increase. That equates to just over $5,000. This is one where, again, it sort of cycles, okay, uh, depending on the year, uh, which departments or shops need new textbooks. You can imagine on the shop side, thinking electrical code book, plumbing code book. Uh, not, uh, there's not, not a new code book every single year, but when they are due, we try to purchase them. On a side note, this is one area, textbooks oftentimes, because Ms. Fairman, Mr. Bianca, uh, we do a great job managing the budget throughout the year. We oftentimes will have uh, a balance within the budget towards the end of the school year, and we try to use that balance to, to pre-buy certain things for the following year. And this is one area where we've been very lucky over the last several years, uh, with that balance, we're able to pre-buy many of the textbooks. So if we're able to do that, the point is, uh, we always run the possibility, if it's a good year of managing the money, that we can use this year's budget to purchase some, if not all, of next year's textbooks, which then frees up that money for got in business that happens next year. So we keep that always in the back of our mind. And then the last one that we, we talked about at the last meeting, a $20,000 increase in the budget, 16% increases the maintenance of buildings. And we talked about that. Uh, aging buildings, increase the uh, cost of supplies and material. Uh, it just costs a lot more money to maintain <coughs> an aging facility. I like that you presented the information this way, the top five increases in top five decreases. Yeah. Many of them, and I have a spreadsheet, if anybody wants to see it individually, I have a spreadsheet with every single subcategory. The vast majority of the subcategories are level funded, uh, which, whether that's good or bad, uh, but it's a, it's 
to bat. So this slide you saw, uh, we've obviously updated it. So we're getting into some of the highlights. So again, the non-resident tuition rate is higher than we were anticipating. It's actually an increase of 2.31% from the current fiscal year, which is good news. We are maintaining the budget uh, for the non-resident students. We are budgeting an increase of 18 students over this year. And we did not change that over the last week or two. Uh, and, and as I mentioned last meeting, I, I hold firm that uh, that 18 is pretty much as high as we want to go. Okay, so as we get into this as a board, if you disagree with some of the decisions, uh, one decision we, you could potentially have is to tell me you want us to increase the number of budgeted non-resident students. The problem is, just as a reminder, if we budget too high and we undersell, we don't get those students on campus, uh, we are automatically now over budget. And how do we make up that gap? In worst case scenario, uh, the city has to then cover that, uh, which we don't want to put the city in that position. And lastly, that's where uh, the extra non-resident student, the extra non-resident tuition that comes in because of the students, uh, we go, it goes into the non-resident tuition revolving account, and that's what we use to pay the Northampton transportation contract that we have for our Northampton students. So again, we have to meet that bill. We want to make sure that we're not uh, overspend and putting that onus on the city. And I just want to highlight again, this sort of goes into some of the conversations and decisions we had to make over the past week. In two years, I think this is an important reminder, the capacity, we meet that capacity for the admissions uh, policy, which is 150 students per year, which means we hit that 600 student. And the reason why our budget went up 5.41% is not because the tuition rate went up 5.41%, it's because we're increasing our enrollment. So once the enrollment sort of flatlines, if that happened this year, we're looking at an increase of only 2.59%. And again, my point I made last, last uh, meeting, that 2.59 is not much higher than the 2.31 that we found an increase in the tuition rate. The point is, Chapter 70 and all the other revenue sources that we do have coming in are such a small fraction of the overall budget. Our life depends on the non-resident students and that tuition rate. And the point is, well, Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so since teachers make up the biggest chunk of our budget, um, what is the percent that that category is increasing this year? Uh, is it on the pie chart? It's not on the. It's hard to see. No, it wouldn't be on the pie chart. I have that um, in the spreadsheet. So if the, um, you can maybe guess, if the, so the biggest increase is for what? About four, four to five percent, somewhere in that range. Really? Yes. So if that continues, and Correct. Yeah. So that's the point I think we need to keep in mind. Yeah. So once we level fund, not level fund, once we sort of, that line, uh, we get to the 600 students, we can only anticipate the increase really being the increase in the non-resident tuition rate. That increase only stays in that two to three percent range. Okay, anything that is going up above that, how do we sustain that? That's the issue. Uh, so that will impact negotiations. Negotiations, impact budgeting, negotiations. programming. Right. The list goes on, and that fact led to some of the discussions and decisions that we made as an administrative team of why do we not advocate, why did I not advocate to support the grant writing position in this coming year's budget? Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. So uh, again, we didn't want to overspend now, knowing in the future we may have to cut back a little bit. Let's be wise and conservative and make sure we do what's right for uh, the students, the staff, and the facilities. But yes, it is a concern down the road. Uh, just want to remind, uh, thank you to the mayor and the city. Uh, obviously, they have their net school spending minimum obligations. Uh, this year, we are anticipating an increase above and beyond that school spending of 4%. And then on top of that, thank you to the mayor for authorizing an additional 50000 above that. Uh, so all of that is also in the budget. 
Again, I won't harp on these two, uh, but again, as we sort of continue down the road of how do we make some difficult decisions and, and make a budget work and support the programming that we have on campus, uh, I would recommend a discussion around Schedule 19, specifically around the MTRS monthly reporting and that obligation and how we recover that responsibility for all of NPS. And then lastly, it's not a Schedule 19, uh, it's an actual uh, budget line item around the stormwater drainage. Uh, I would advocate that that's a discussion. Is there any way that we could receive some level of credit? Uh, it's not going to save the day. It's not going to totally make a budget. Uh, but when that day comes, uh, every penny is worth it. So just, I think it's worthy of the conversation. This has not changed. Our priority around staffing is the assistant principal, okay, which is why you see that the largest increase being in that principal subcategory. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, where do we put that additional assistant principal, the goal would be to have the two assistant principals and the principal in the main office and moving the vocational director over to the current office that the athletic director has and then uh, renovate a closet in the gym for the athletic director. Uh, it makes sense on many different levels. Uh, everybody's happy with that decision. Uh, so if you're wondering where we're going to put people, uh, that's the plan. So what is in this uh, balanced budget? Uh, what you're going to hear next week is a recommendation from the negotiation subcommittee. Uh, last meeting, I believe it was, the board voted on uh, instituting the city longevity for non, uh, all, all non uh, uh, bargaining groups. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Couldn't think of the word. Yeah. Um, so we already implemented that. But then we, we discussed as a subcommittee, uh, was that enough? In essence, was $100 for five years experience enough to say thank you uh, to the non-representative groups? So you're going to hear a recommendation next meeting uh, that we're going to ask the, the board to vote on. Uh, I do support that longevity amount, and we are budgeting for that at this time. But you'll see that that motion next next week. Uh, so that is in the budget. So next week, if you happen to approve the budget tonight, you'll know that we've already budgeted for it. Okay, uh, so we're not looking to cut someplace else to institute it if you decide to vote on next week. Now, eliminating the grant writer position. Now, you may say, Andy, uh, we're getting an, an additional sixty-eight thousand. Uh, why aren't you just maintaining the, the grant writer? Uh, several reasons. <clears throat> so one is looking at the additional assistant principal that we're, we're getting. That's going to alleviate some of the evaluation load that Joe has and, and some of the other administrators. And I specifically look at Joe uh, as sort of the, the lead grant writer over the last several month, uh, last several years. If Joe has less evaluations to do, does that free him up a little bit to continue some of the grant writing? Uh, I'm not looking for Joe to go out and be the grant writer to search for grants, but to maintain sort of the, the current model, I think we can manage that. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, the point is, by cutting the grant writer position, it allows us to not cut in other areas. And as a reminder, that materials and supply line, we level funded. Which means, again, uh, if the cost of copper continues to go up, uh, but we're level funding plumbing, most likely that means less copper in front of the electrical students. Same, uh, plumbing students, I mean, and, uh, across the board. Okay, if, if the cost of wood continues to go up, but we're giving Mr. Muirbergen and Mr. Miller the same amount of money in cabinet making and carpentry, it means that there's less wood in front of the students. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the other piece around cutting the grant writer position, we have to at least be cognizant of the fact that the facilities director is retiring at some point in the near future. I don't know what the near future is. Uh, and I will stand here, and I think I mentioned it last meeting, uh, when that day comes, I'll be the first one to advocate that we split that position into the facilities director and the lands manager position, uh, which will be an increase in the budget. Uh, so I'd hate to get down the road, too far down the road, having a full-time grant writer on staff and not for a long term, and then we can let that person go because we want to split that position for the facilities director to the, the lands manager role. Um, and then lastly, you may ask me, Where's that money going? So again, we put it into the extraordinary maintenance line. As I mentioned uh, last meeting, that was the line that we used to do a lot of the improvements around campus, such as the front sign, the locker rooms, uh, teacher break rooms, uh, on and on and on and on. Again, the whole list that you saw. 
Going into last week, that budget line was down to approximately 25,000, give or take. Okay, in essence, it gave us very little money to do anything on campus. So we were basically done. By putting the, the additional $68,000 that we received as of last night because of the increased non-resident tuition rate, by putting that 68,000 additional money into the extraordinary maintenance line, it gives us not necessarily a buffer, and I'm not looking to, to pad money, but we also know, at your last board meeting, we have so many construction projects on campus. You don't have to be reminded of, of that fact. And you know, as we're going down the road of, of renovating and rebuilding, sometimes we've had those in-kind donations because of the skills capital grants, and we may forget to budget something, or we're missing something, or there's an increase in cost. By having that line available, it allows us to tap into that line to help cover some of the building costs without having to go back to the board to ask for the uh, a tuition, tuition revolving transfer. So that's, that was the decision. Save on the grant writer, make sure we have the money available for extraordinary maintenance, and it avoids difficult personnel decisions in a year, two, or three years when we have to make some of those difficult decisions. And then back to your question about long-term sustainability, how do we manage more personnel if the budget's only going to be going up 3% over the long haul, but we have you know, salaries going to apply to that. So many decisions, that's what I stand by tonight, but again, I'm open to discussions. Yes. Um, so am I understanding you that the you're, we're, we're going to, you're proposing putting money into the extraordinary maintenance line item, and if our facilities director retires, we can tap into that money to help create a second position, and if we don't, then we've got the money to spend on projects that we're doing? That would be one definite option. So again, going in before yesterday, yeah. remember the last meeting, we were approximately fifty to $60,000 short. Right. So we were charged to close that gap. The decision on how to close the gap was to not fund the grant writer position. Right. That basically eliminates the gap. Right. Then all of a sudden, last night, we have the influx of money. So yeah. now, it's, do we reinstitute the grant yeah. writer that I had cut three days ago, yeah. or do we put that money into extraordinary maintenance? We decided on that. So yes, if Mr. Smith happens to retire in this fiscal year, then it would be possible. That's an easy it's pot of money. Not, I hate to say a pot of money, but it would not impact other personnel lines. Right. It would not impact. Uh, Supplies and materials. It wouldn't impact related to that work. Exactly. Yeah. Without impacting the students directly. And when you were considering eliminating the grant writer position, um, were you thinking at all about the um, availability of candidates for the position? Like, did that factor into it? Yes. On top of uh, the other question that we were having and debating was uh, the idea that we, we floated around. Uh, could that grant writing position oversee the capital campaign initiative that we, we want to do as a board as well? Right. And, and we agreed, and tonight's probably not the night, but my recommendation, uh, if we do eliminate the grant writing position, if that's off the table, I don't think the capital campaign should be off the table. You know, we need to continue to focus on that. Uh, but one idea I would stand in front of the board and, and, and advocate for, would the board support using some of the trustee accounts okay, to help fund a firm, basically a capital campaign firm. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not using operating budget money, which directly impacts the kids. We have other revenue sources that are to your discretion. Would that be a better use of that money? Hopefully then generate a capital campaign fundraising without impacting the, the school budget. <coughs> Something to think about is an idea that we had to try to, how do we make this budget work? How do we make the next several budgets work? While not forgetting about the capital campaign initiative and, and need there. Um, As I've said already, uh, this budget does level fund the supplies and materials, and just as a reminder, uh, it also includes the, the necessity to increase the, the budget line for NEAC because this is the big year. Me, oh, uh, that, that line, that last one, yep. I mean, we uh, have had many discussions over the years, and the amount of, of uh, input as far as our children going to college doing things like that, it has come to the, I think, I've heard, if I heard correctly, that NES is not as important today as it was in the past. I would think if we're going to do a budget cut item, I would recommend only to abolish that. So if that's $6,000, that's a lot of money. Plus the impact it has for them to come on campus for a period of time, feed them, clothe them, Hotels, yada yada yada. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a recommendation, which I hear loud and clear. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we had a discussion with the faculty. Uh, because I, I shared it with the board as well. Uh, I was sort of in that camp of, is it time to move away from NAAC? Uh, there is a strong sentiment from the staff that we're not quite ready to jump ship. Uh, do we want to be the first one to jump ship? Uh, is there still a connection to the colleges? Uh, is there a perception, a PR perception out in the community if, if we no longer have that accreditation? Do we want to go down that road? Um, so that's why we sort of decided let's continue. Uh, that $6,000 increase is this one fiscal year. Uh, I think we typically, our annual membership, I'm looking at crystals, more like the 3000 give or take is the normal annual membership. This is an increase for the one year, so it's about 9000 uh, After this coming year, it goes back down to the 3000 So this increase happens every 10 years. Uh, but the point is, over the course, my, my argument I was making a couple years ago, even if it's only $3,000 a year, that's times 10 years for the cycle, we've just spent $30,000 for NEAC, plus another 6,000. So you're looking at 36 to $40,000 for and NEAC. Is it funding. worth it? That's, I think it's a sound discussion to have. And don't forget the staff well, time. And the staff that, time. Because that, that's huge. And right. if, they, if they're benefiting from it, great. But if they're not benefiting from it, that's not a good way for them to but, spend. But due, due to our aging campus, that all they do is keep dumbing us for having an aging campus. And Tim uses his magic powers to get through it, but um, they said, well, we'll use our power with the mayor and governmental officials to get you more money. I've been here 13 years. I haven't seen a dime. I, I so. agree. Right. Okay. So those are the highlights. If you want, let's pull out your budget that you should have in front of you. And I won't necessarily go line by line and bore you, but I can just kind of walk you through the budget, kind of show you what you're looking at in, in any conversations. Because again, at the end of the day, you as a board have line item authority. So, which in essence means if there's a line that you don't agree with, whether it's going up or down or staying the same, you do have the opportunity as a board to vote uh, to tell us you want that raised, lowered, or whatnot. The first page, beyond after the, the cover page, this is sort of that the one page revenue summary sheet. Okay, uh, You see the top half to two thirds outlines the revenue sources. What I'm looking at is the blue shaded, so the right side of that page, uh, the FY24. You'll see 445. We are budgeting 445 non-resident students. You see the tuition amount, you see the grand total. Next line is, is special ed. So special ed regulations changed a few years ago uh, to make Ms. Wanzik's job more complicated. Uh, but any, any services rendered through the IEP, we can sort of bill out, okay, and get some reimbursement. Uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, in years past, it's sort of a flat rate. Uh, so we budget $145,000 through that process. Then you see the chapter 70. Revenue coming in, you see Smith Charities, they provide us some money, that's the 6500 You see the additional contribution for net school spending. That gives us a munis number, so this is sort of the, the budget that the city has to keep an eye on, of $10,760,022. Then we have the indirect uh, costs, i.e. Schedule 19, that's the two million and some change. The grants that we receive. And then the tuition revolving, you see that 187,961, that is to cover the anticipated transportation contract for our Northampton students. So the grand total, and that's what you see on, on my summary sheets in the presentation, of the 13,488,374. Now down below, the expenses is basically, obviously it has to balance out. That's what you see on, on the, the summary page. Now we get into you know, the line items of the budget. Kind of go, you know, go through. If you have any specific questions, by all means, uh, I've already told Crystal and Joe. You know, they, they feel free to chime in with any any input or answers as well. This is more of a discussion. So the the very first subcategory is the school committee expense. 
So you see the clerical, that's part of Ms. Carver's uh, salary, uh, the, the stipends for the three electeds, and then you go through all the other lines that the board will oversee. And then that blue shaded, that last row, it, it says total 1110 school committee expenses, the grand total of 55250 You'll see that on the, at the end of each of these subcategories. Those totals are, are what I was using to then build that pie chart as the example. Okay. Is um, public liability, is that the retainer for our law firm? No, well, that's a different line. Trustee, you no. Know, okay. The public liability line under trustees. Yes. So there's, um, we've been caught uh, a few times where there's been a um, surcharge for different um, legal issues. Um, so that's a line that would Um, so Let's say the district had a lawsuit, right. and they expected it to be over in three years, but yep. it's still going five years later. Yep. The insurance company that we work with, the city works with, would actually charge you a, a, a fee because it's still ongoing. So it's an additional cost that's not, it, not necessarily covered. So it could be any legal expense or other things. It could also have to do with maybe there's uh, something going on about um, unemployment uh, that there's a there's somebody challenging and, and things like that. So there's different lines, there's different things that would hit. So it's not the actual retainer for the attorney, it's uh, when they're actually engaged in a case. So they, the retainer doesn't necessarily cover that part of it. So is that like so That's our, our insurance? liability insurance. So it's insurance that covers this, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the next category is the superintendent's category. And again, as we were talking about NEAC, that's where that falls under the superintendent's category is the last line in that one. Uh, so again, this current fiscal year, which is the paint column, you can see we were budgeting $3,895. So when I said it was in that 3000 range, pretty close, you know, we are now budgeting 10000 because of the, the big review coming in. Why did the activity keep these? From 15, 17, 15, 17, 15. Yes. Then we move to the other district admin. Again, the big, redu the big reduction is uh, eliminating the grant writer position that you saw uh, budgeted in the pink column is not budgeted in the blue column. That's the main reduction there. What does public, what does public relations step on? When we push the social media uh, advertisements for applications, the movie theater during the application season when we do the uh, commercials or the previews in the, in the movie theater, uh, when we buy the mailing labels to send out postcards to eighth graders, uh, the gifts that, that we give when they come, the t-shirts that we give incoming freshmen, um, all those kinds of items. The advertising in the newspaper, Next category is the business and finance. So again, between the personnel and then all of the other lines that would be included in that, in that department. Next page, we get into human resources, same activity, the salary that pertains to that area, along with the other lines, you know, two other lines in that area. What's next? Sometimes we have to send people for physicals, um, for fitness for duty, and I'm just thinking COVID test, but mm -hmm. it could be in the next fiscal year. <laughs> yeah, no. And then back to the question around legal, this is the legal category uh, where we're budgeting 30000 How? So how often do we stay within budget, over budget, under budget? What's our, what's our pattern? Yeah. Um, you can answer that, but this coming year should be a lighter year because uh, unit D is done, unit H is done. Mm -hmm. It all depends on I'm laughing at Ms. Wines. I keep getting out of trouble. <laughs> uh, you, if you have more detail. Um, Julie, we, we have been under budget. Um, there was one case, one scenario with the um, attorney's contract that we went over. Okay. Actually, they went over without notifying us. Oh, thank you. Then we get into the, the curriculum uh, department. This is not curriculum, I think the category is a little misleading. Uh, 
this is not curriculum such as Mr. Parks. I believe this is like Ms. Wanzik, your area, okay? So even though it's college curriculum, it's more falling under the, the jurisdiction of Ms. Wanzik. <clears throat> The next category are the department heads. <coughs> that has not changed. As far as you're the contract? Yes. The next category that we talked about earlier uh, is the principal category. So again, just to highlight, that second line would be the, the second FTE for the assistant principal. That's the cause of the, the biggest increase in that category. And then I, I mentioned convocation uh, earlier, and that is about two-thirds of the way down in that category. It's called other supply. It went from 500 to 2,000, just to, again, better project the cost of convocation. What is your um, ideal timeline for posting the second AP position? The day after the budget is approved. So if you approve it tonight, it will be posted tomorrow. If it's uh, approved next Tuesday, it will be posted next Wednesday. And are you optimistic that you'll get um, a good candidate pool? I don't think we'll have a large candidate pool from I'm hearing from other schools across the state. Um, I think we'll have we'll quality. We'll find somebody. Next category is the building technology. So personnel in and into all the lines of paint and technology. Where do the, um, where does the key system, would that be the technology or would that be under um, So the purchase and everything is without a tuition revolving. Um, Josh, if there's any software expense, it would be under Josh's line in the district. Okay. And so the, the physical um, equipment that was required, where is that located in the budget? No, we, 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 we bought that from tuition revolving. We paid the whole, it was voted, gotcha. and it was all paid out. So it wasn't part of this? Correct. The next section are the teacher salaries. So again, that 43% or so of the overall budget, you can see $4.6 million. The next section are the teacher specialists. There's six FTEs that fall into that category, and along with longevity and whatnot. Now this is just one example. I just want to point out since I'm looking at it. Uh, on that cover page, we talked about grants. So this is one example in the teacher specialist subcategory. There's a column called grants. It's the next column over from the blue column, the, the proposed budget. So right now we're budgeting 43,956 from one of the grants uh, to help out with uh, special ed tutoring services. That would be an example. So we're spending $500,000 for six people? Or no, six people plus the teachers plus, and the... Plus, correct. Okay, gotcha. Yes. The six people would equate to the 473,000 yeah. plus longevity. Yeah. Then we move into the substitute category. Are, uh, the first one is we call the permanent sub, educational associate, and then our, our daily subs. And that's where that, that line item is. <clears throat> and then we have a sub coordinator uh, that helps Mr. Bianca in the scheduling of all the subs. Paraprofessionals. Again, you can see the FTEs, and you can see how we assign whether the pairs are. Uh, part of the operating budget, that would be the blue column, or they fall in one of the grants that we have, that would fall under that grant column. How do we decide how much money goes into tuition revolving? Elementary, uh, uh, the basic math would be anything that comes in above and beyond what we're budgeting on that first page. So anything that comes in above and beyond the 445 non-resident students. So if 446 students come out of resident, that one would go into the and so we want to we want to lowball the projections because our tuition revolving is our our, our stabilization fund. Correct. Okay. And transportation fund. Correct. 
And right now, based on the spending and based on all the construction that's going on, um, we are under a million dollars, correct? We go for that. <laughs> but it's like when we want to get, we want to have the buildings be more secure and we haven't budgeted for the keep out system, that's why we can turn the fishing e volume. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of having to wait another budget year. Correct. And it's that fine line, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you want to spend all you can. You want to spend. The money's coming in. The, the setting districts are giving us that money to yeah. educate their children. Right. They're not giving us that money to put into a savings account that we can just bank. Yeah. So it's a very fine line. Yeah. But you also want to be fiscally responsible. Long term, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So after paraprofessionals, we go into the library media center. The way this works out is that really is the one individual. That's our library. Mm -hmm. Our library. <coughs> Her supplies are later on. Then we move into staff PD between stipends and, and professional development. And then again, you see a lot of money set aside in grants for the staff PD as well. Then we get into, into textbooks. As we mentioned, you can see sort of the, the, the flow uh, between the years. You can see where some years we're buying books, other years we're not buying books. Okay. I next get new books since I was elected. Yes. And again, the hope would be at, towards the end of this fiscal year, we're able to pre-buy some of these, which again would free up some money. Uh, and it's a great cycle to be in as long as we can do that. Who decides uh, where the textbook money goes? Would that be um, Melanie for vocational teachers and Mike for academic teachers? Plus Joe. Plus Crystal, plus myself. So, correct. So the department heads in their budget requests that are submitted back Christmas time, yep. uh, they would be requesting at that time we need new, new textbooks. So then when we meet with the, the department heads in the month of January and February, they advocate why they need those books, uh, and then it works out through Joe and Crystal. Um, so. Next is the instructional materials. As I mentioned, it's level funded. Then we move into the instructional equipment. That would be the, uh, well, I was talking about copier earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, that reduction of the 5,000 was because we paid off the one copier in, in graphics. So we're still paying $44,000 for the contract. And then uh, that, that same section, you'll see it says school-wise safety Perkins. Uh, that's what we're anticipating for uh, the Perkins, uh, <coughs> correct? That's based on this year? Correct. We don't know. What exactly, that, that comes out, typically that comes out uh, late summertime. Uh, I know the state's trying to revamp the timeline, uh, but currently, and again, as a reminder, uh, since we're there, $100,000, and the, the concept, the theory behind Perkins, that is money that we're supposed to use to uh, improve the equipment in front of the students. Uh, it also uh, is the money that we use for a lot of staff professional development. That's also the line that we pay teachers to, to staff the three county fair. Uh, so the point is, if we didn't want to do any professional development, if we didn't want to staff the, the fairs, ballpark $100,000. One CNC mill in manufacturing is approximately $250,000. So there's no way we can support a vocational school on $100,000, which is why I keep advocating for the skills capital grants. Uh, that's the only way we, we are in existence is because we have those skills capital grants. Because $100,000 a year will not and $100,000 is the entirety of the U.S. government's contribution to vocational education. Yes, Google. In, in a $13 million budget. That's a little surprising. Okay. Next page. General supplies. Again, this is your copy paper and other supplies to support the the operation of the school, which is 25,000. The r and vehicle, 12,000. Chris, will you have top of your head? That's for the um, large machine um, supplies, maintenance. Thank you. Next category is the other instructional. This is what I was talking about earlier uh, this evening. These are all of the licenses and testing for not only the students, but also the staff, depending on who they are. Uh, and you can see sort of how that fluctuates year to year. Then we go into instructional hardware devices, the 30,000. No, that one? That's part of Josh's subject. 
Okay. That's for district-wide um, equipment. Computers, mm -hmm. basically. Correct. Okay. And uh, that's why I, I believe I mentioned this last meeting, maybe the, the meeting before. Uh, you may question why we level funding technology. Okay, we should always be investing in technology, uh, but we have. Uh, so all of the COVID money, ARPA money, we are pumping a lot of that into Chromebooks and, and whatnot. We've increased uh, access technology uh, exponentially, uh, which has allowed us to level fund that without losing access to uh, technology for our students. So I don't want the board to think that we're, we're coming up short in technology. <coughs> Other instructional hardware, the 7500. You know what that one is, Crystal? Yeah. It's um, for miscellaneous supplies that Josh needs to purchase for the, for the school. You know, dentist software licenses, we've talked about that. That's a slight reduction, that's the 39,000. Then we move into guidance. That's our two school counselors. Next page, it gets into the other positions within that, that department. Then we have our school psychologist. Then we jump down to the medical health services. So that's basically the staffing and all the supplies to support our school nurse uh, in, a, in that operation. Do we know about um, how many student visits are made per day or per week to the nurse? We do. They log it all. We could tell you what that average is. I'd be curious to know. Because I think that's just a super important um, you know, service that's provided. I would say it's probably higher than the average. I think just looking at the high needs population that we have. Yeah. Uh, I think I was I was supervising the FFA leaving this morning and going through the bag checks, and both nurses were down there checking meds and everything else. And yeah, uh, yeah it, it's a lot. It's a lot. And then in yeah. a vocational school, there's just more after yeah. scrapes and nicks and yeah. bumps. And it's, and it's such an important investment in student well-being. Correct. Then we move into the athletic budget. As I mentioned earlier, uh, half of Mr. LaRoe's salary is covered in that particular line. Uh, the other half follows in uh, the guidance line uh, as a co-op coordinator. That's where the, that half of the salary goes. But then you can see the, coach, the coaches. Uh, one increase that we have, and I just highlight it here. It's the contracted services, officials, and police. You see an increase there of just over $8,000. You may ask why. Uh, and I think Mr. Lerow alluded to it when he had his report. Uh, but during the basketball season, it was a difficult year around supervision, not only of the student section, but sometimes the adults as well. And, and we made an administrative decision. We needed to have a, a, more pre a bigger presence there, so we hired uh, more adult staffing, and we made sure that we had police presence as well. And it really helped. And, hearing some qualitative data, uh, the behavior definitely improved after we did that. So that's the increase there. Uh, and I fully support that. Uh, and that's, that's been a problem nationally. Correct. So I, I think I don't that. want to be on CNN about a, right. an issue in the basketball game, So, Mayor, can you tell us a little bit about, I know that the city is exploring, um, uh, I don't want to say like alternatives to police, but maybe alternatives to police, maybe like supplemental programs to police. We have the division of community care that we've started under the Department of Health and Human Services. So, so actually, there was just a big presentation on it last night right. um, in front of the city council. Um, so what I'm wondering about, so I'm thinking about sporting events when mm -hmm. families are there, young children, mm -hmm. students and a lot of raucous energy mm -hmm. and thinking that that might be if we're spending you know um a, a third of what we spend on coaches on police mm -hmm. and staff at those events um w w w my preference would be to invest it in pe in that depart a department like that of community care so not i don't know that uniform yeah. officers are necessarily Total transparency. Yeah. That, that one line is not only for the police and adult supervision. It's also for the officials, referees. Oh, okay. Yeah. So but but still, there's an, the, the increase really is based on the supervision that we want. Right. But a lot of that line is gotcha. for the referees. Okay. So in any case, like, so having some, I'm thinking that a sporting event, that would be an ideal opportunity for community care um, folks to be present in, in rather than police officers, like uniform. It's officers. an interesting idea. It's not... So, I mean, it's not one of the areas I've heard discussed before around community care in terms of attending events like that. 
Um, but you know, we could talk about it more. Like, and then you get it up and running. Being hired to work on right, sure. and it hasn't. Yeah. They haven't been discussed as being hired for detail in that way. Like, gotcha. PBR. Um, so this is a new concept. Let me think about it, and okay. I'll talk to Commissioner O'Leary a little bit, and we can uh, see whether that's you know it. So they are just getting yep. started. The yep. director just um, started like two or three weeks ago. So it's oh, a right, very. Oh, because you hired that person. There's a. Or there was a hiring. There was a hire, yeah. Kristen yeah. Rhodes yeah. is now the, dir the director of the Division of Community Care. Um, and so it's very. They're going to be hiring for their responders. And so it's at the very beginning stages of, of actually getting up and running. But I will have a discussion with the commissioner and see what she thinks. Thank you. And I'm also wondering about, um, you know, thinking about this younger generation that has se seems to have such a commitment to social justice, environmental justice, you know, um, that if we could, like, supplement our criminal justice program with, with, I think that some of our students might be interested in pursuing that avenue in addition to being exposed to all the other avenues, you know, to say, like, this is a... This is a um, this is something that they might be interested in learning more about. You know, as, as our policing models, I think, are expanding. It's definitely also explore their students. The programs are, are starting, and we're still one of the new ones, but um, and we're unique in that we're embedded in public health as opposed to um, PD or public safety. But um, gotcha. they are there are more and more programs being started around the country. Thank you. I'm just. Really, the only other highlight I'll, I'll have within the athletic uh, budget would be the travel game bus line. It's not an increase, uh, but again, thirty-five thousand dollars. If you look at the the proportion of the athletic budget that goes to busing versus some of the other lines, mm -hmm. uh, it is substantial. Uh, this again is above and beyond our buses. This is when we have to uh, contract out for the yellow buses. Uh, that's a concern. Okay, uh, and, and as a reminder, I was a supporter, and I will remain a supporter of the statewide tournaments, um, but if Smith Vocational makes the a state tournament and they have to travel to Eastern Mass, or we get into the Vogue tournament and we travel to Eastern Mass, uh, there are the costs. Um, and then the other one, I say this, uh, not to encourage athletic user fees. Uh, we are probably one of the few high schools remaining that do not charge student athletes a user fee. I stand by that wholeheartedly. Uh, again, a grand total of $300,000 of a $13 million budget. Um, we can argue on either side. I think offering this opportunity for our student athletes at no cost, knowing who our students are, uh, is a great benefit for the school. It's great for the students. Uh, so I will stand by that. If someday the budget really goes south and we really have to make some difficult decisions, you know, let's have the conversation. But at this point, I want to stand firm that uh, we don't move toward a, a, a user fee model. How many sports do we offer, and how many students? I know we saw those numbers not very long ago. We just did the numbers too. Yeah. I I'll, want to say I'll, I'll, I can look it up myself. It's oh yeah, I, I can do it very quickly for you. Yeah. Um, let's see. We offer about thirteen actual sports. Yeah. Um, I believe it's thirteen, <clears throat> and then with co-ops. Um, so for that count, that's male and female sports. Yep. Okay. The average participation <clears throat> that Jeff gets the fall is the highest participation, has the most sports in it. Yep. Um, and then I believe that that's probably somewhere around 135 kids, 140. Yep. Uh, and then in the winter and in the spring, winters are small, smaller one, uh, under 100 students participate, and then in the spring, uh, it's right around 100. Thank you. The next subcategories on the next page is our student activities. You do see a, an increase, and again, I'll, I'll fully support the increase. We have some additional stipended positions. These are clubs and activities as an example of getting a, an additional student government advisor, as one example. Uh, the other increase in here, I'll just point out, is under the assemblies. We're increasing that by about 4,000. Uh, and I want to, again, uh, celebrate Mr. Bianca uh, bringing in Grit and Whip, uh, which is an activity that's finally happening this Friday. Uh, 
we can talk about that maybe next meeting after we have it. But it's a, a great idea, just again, team building for the students. And, and um, there's a, another assembly that he brings in uh, in the fall, again, to sort of bring the, the student body together. Uh, so whatever we can do to, to improve that experience for the students, let's do it. Uh, so that, that's that area. And just as a reminder, uh, this is also where we have FFA and skills. Uh, we financially support both of those uh, up to $20,000. It doesn't cover all of their expenses, but it definitely helps. And again, as a reminder, uh, a few boards ago, and a few budgets ago, uh, when we had a tight budget, I did make a recommendation that we cut those two back. And uh, that was one example where the boards said, no, we want to fully support skills and FFA, and we went back to fully funding that. So uh, just from a history perspective. <clears throat> the next. Subcategory, now we begin to get into sort of the support roles, okay? So custodial, as I mentioned, this was one of the, the larger increases. A lot of this is salary. And just as one piece, again, long-term planning, back to do we fund the grant writer position knowing that we're making some difficult decisions. Long-term, this is one area that we have to decide, and I want to fully support this going into the budget the following year. But in custodial expense, the second line, we have seven custodians. 299000 worth of salaries within the budget, but then in the grant, we do have, we've been calling it a COVID custodian, because um, we're covering that particular salary out of one of the, uh, the grants that we got. That grant runs up at the end of this year, okay? Uh, I want to advocate that that position, we don't get rid of the position, we roll that position into the operating budget. Because uh, at that point, we're going to have, obviously, the new animal science building up and running. Uh, we're going to have, eventually, uh, the, the soon-to-be former pig barn. Uh, that will become the companion animal uh, building. That's going to have to be cleaned and maintained. Uh, so this is going to be a greater need on campus. So uh, I do not want to get rid of that custodian uh, when that grant runs out. So we'll be ready to, to absorb that into the, the operating budget. Good point. You're going to bump students. Correct. More students. Uh, there's more cleaning and maintenance involved. So, uh, again, that's another area that we're just trying to project out long term, and we want to be ready for that. What grade is that? It's one of the upper. That's what I thought. Yes, there are two. Okay. Next category is. Make this on that by the end of this fiscal this coming fiscal year. FY FY twenty four. Okay. Next category is the our heat. We'd love funding that. And we're on track to spend it all right now. Oh, absolutely. Next category we talked about uh, last meeting and tonight is utilities. Again, the, the large increase. You can see the specific, the specific lines. Mostly around electricity increase of about $30,000. And then increases elsewhere. It says storm. Sewer and storm are those the two lines that we would be looking to have that mitigated by the city? The storm, just the, the storm. 18,000. And so, what would we be looking for all 18 or a reduction? I think a reduction is the fairest. Okay. And again, my point earlier tonight, even if it was totally you know, eliminated, 18,000 doesn't necessarily make or break the bank. Um, but when we begin to have some very difficult conversations, I'm just looking at fairness and, and equity. That would be one line for the, for the discussion. Oh, covering the yes. Correct. <laughs> Next category is the maintenance of grounds. And this also includes our summer help, correct? So we've been getting into the, the routine the last few years. We hire some student workers. Uh, we hire uh, either Mr. Onstock and or Mr. Nevin, and, and we maintain some of the, the mowing over the summer. And they try to take on an improvement project each summer as well. So you saw, you probably see when you come in to see me, uh, the split rail fence outside of A building, uh, that's just one particular project. And, and we, we have a whole list of ideas and, and a vision that we want to, to sort of take on. Uh, that's where we, we fund that particular operation. Then we get into maintenance of buildings. We've talked about that increase. It's usually three to four, depending on student interest. It's really cool to come on campus and see them working. 
and it, again, that alleviates some of the needs of the custodians. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think being a vocational school, before we had, uh, I'm not faulting the custodians, they have a million and, and two other projects to focus on. Mm -hmm. But when you come on campus over the summer before the students, and you know, the grass is long and the weeds are growing, it, it just it wasn't a, a good impression for a vocational school. So it maintains that like right. curb appeal. Yeah. So we get to maintenance of buildings. You see those particular lines. We get into the building security system. This is not building security that falls under the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of Mr. Brown, such as security cameras. Uh, this is the actual security alarm that we have cost to maintain that. Then we get into maintenance of equipment, for HVAC, AC, so on and so forth. That is extraordinary maintenance. Now this is what I was alluding to. So again, we budgeted this year the 86,000. Uh, what I am proposing this evening is that budget be 93,299. But again, that includes the additional 68,000 that we saw as of last night. So without that 68,000, you can see what that line was going to be this evening, which is basically nothing uh, to do anything on campus. And in God forbid, we have uh, the need to do something when it comes to some of the building projects that we have. So I, I do stand behind that 93,000. And uh, just for perspective, last couple, you know, before this 86, that was reduced. We were up in the 120,000 range. Uh, for that particular line over the last few years. So that's how we were able to invest a lot on campus. We're not back at the 120,000 range. Uh, so just so you know, from big picture wise, 93,000 is not on the high end. Then we get into technology maintenance. We move into the last page, almost done. We get into the separation costs that I mentioned earlier. Okay, again, we're not projecting any unused sick time or vacation buyback, which is why we're zeroing out that subcategory. Unemployment, we budget 50000 We obviously hope that we don't have to spend that, but you never know, depending on the year. Did we spend the 50000 this year? No, but we are using it for a few former employees. And then we get into some of the insurance that we have that we have to cover outside of legal counsel. So with what you have in front of you, it is balanced between the projected revenues and the proposed expenses. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair. Super proud of everything that you um, question. Yes. Sure. And you started out with the savings uh, slide, five categories, and basically do cyclical, cyclical things and licenses or whatever it may be. But I would suspect that's going to rear its ugly head in a year or two, meaning <coughs> we're not going to have those types of savings. Correct. So as an example, this coming year, where we're saving a little bit on the student testing, the licenses, and with staffing, and we're saving approximately 5,000. Yes, in another year, that, that 5,000 savings could be on the other side. It could be an increase of 5,000, correct? Yep. So we have a benefit year this year. Correct. Okay. Yes. Really, the only, to plan on these reductions, the employee separation, you know, we're saving the 12,000. We can't plan on that every single year. Most likely we're going to have separations. Yeah, uh, that's where I was going. Exactly. The grant writer, chances are that's going to be reallocated someday, whether we do get the grant writer or the facility director position is split. So that's not going to be an ongoing savings long term. We just mentioned the student testing and licenses. The software, as a cycle, you know, right now we're, saving, we're planning on saving 5,000, but the following year it could be up. And then that copier line, that five thousand dollars savings, that could be because we're done paying that particular copier. But who knows when a new contract comes out? Right. Assuming that goes out. So, so you're right. Okay. Um, another comment about the grant writer. So, you, you've had discussion amongst the other uh, <laughs> stakeholders, and you feel you can still continue getting the grants that we've been successful in getting without affecting uh, the, 
the trickle down effect of how it affects the students in terms of taking them away from doing that sort of the other duties they need to do um, by bringing on another assistant principal. Yes, uh, I would not, I will not assume uh, that Mr. Bianca will have the time to go out and research new grants. But when a skills capital grant is posted, I think we have an internal discussion. Do we want to go for a skills capital grant or do we have to hit the pause button? I think just politically it might make sense to hit the pause button to allow other state, other schools to, to get it. We've gotten basically all of them recently. Uh, but once we're ready to reapply for a skills capital grant, uh, yes, having the, the additional assistant principal will reduce Mr. Bianca's evaluations by uh, enough. Um, he's still going to be a busy man. Uh, but the other piece around the assistant principal, unfortunately for Mr. Bianca, and I walked in his shoes, uh, and I used to joke about this all the time, when you're the assistant principal and the principal's out for a day, your job doesn't really change. You're still managing the school, you're managing students. But when you're the principal and your assistant principal is out for the day, you're not the principal for that day. You're the assistant principal. So all of his work stops. Uh, and because of the amount of student behavior that we've had to manage over the last couple of years, uh, Mrs. Sabonis is top notch. I am okay. He is unbelievable, but he is maxed out plus some, which means sort of that surplus falls on Mr. Bianca's plate. Uh, so if we're able to alleviate some of that student management that mm -hmm. falls on Mr. Bianca's plate, along with alleviating some of the evaluations, which would benefit all of the administrators, uh, that would free up more time for Mr. Bianca to focus on when the, the grants do come up. Uh, that we can stand out for that. All right, so you just made a good point. Politically, we should maybe step away from going after some of these bigger capital skills grants due to we've been successful in getting a number of them. So how's that going to affect us in the big picture that we're going to maybe take a step back? I say a step back for a cycle. I don't think we should be taking years off. Um, but typically, in a, in a given fiscal year, the, the, the past routine has been two cycle, two skills capital grants per fiscal year has been sort of the, the average. So if we skip one round, uh, we could still potentially apply for a second round if there was a second round uh, this coming year. Uh, but I would not be advocating that we skip two, three, four years of right, skills right. capital grants. Okay. Thank and, you. And knowing the political climate, uh, the new governor has expressed in some of her conversations about raising the level of financial remuneration to vocational schools. So that could have an impact in regards to filling some voids that we may have. And if, in fact, she has the money and, and they agree to do that. So at least it's positive information. Correct. Okay. When, when health insurance costs skyrocketed, um, you know, municipalities turned to the GIC to um, mitigate those. And I know that energy costs are hitting everybody really hard. Um, and that's a huge chunk of our budget. If it keeps increasing and when it's increasing, that's what's going to torpedo us probably more than anything. Is there, are there any kind of, um, any kind of collaboration, any kind of, like, is there any relief in sight? in terms of energy costs for municipalities, for school districts like ours? I'm not hearing of any. There's no crystal ball for that. Yeah, my, my only concern about the utility cost is it will go up when we rebuild the horticulture building, which will be all electric. Right. Uh, so there'll be that increased cost. Uh, how can we mitigate utilities? Uh, I, there's been discussion over the years about potential additional solar arrays. Uh, and I know we have some down in the, the old tennis courts. Uh, we do get a credit on our utility bill because of that. Are there other options? There's pros and cons to that. that, that, that that's a worthy conversation to have. But beyond that, as far as a, a crystal ball to see if the utility costs are going to go down or if there's any cost savings or working with the city, I haven't heard of any, honestly, at this point. But. Or if communities are banding together somehow to. It's just unsustainable. Well, they did have a rollback from just recently mm -hmm. uh, on the electric. electricity cost, yes. Uh, so, uh, look, Tennessee had an 8% increase this year, so mm -hmm. it's not like that. It, it solved all the problems. Yeah. 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 And there was a yeah. 
people were not happy about moving to the DIC. A lot of kicking and screaming. Okay. Where are we at, Mr. Chairman? I am ready. But we have a motion and discussion for possible action to vote to approve the FY24 budget. I move to approve. I second. Is there any further discussion? It's just an outstanding job, incredibly informative, really well thought out. I have a deeper understanding of the budget than I ever have before. I feel like I could answer any questions that came my way out in the community. And sort of, it equips me to advocate for the school. So Thank we you. have a vote and a second, I mean, a motion and a second on the possible action to vote. Now I'd like to have a motion in a second to actually approve the FY24 budget as presented. That's what my motion was. Well, that's not what the question was initially. Okay, I move that. Okay. I second. That's what I needed. Okay, Thank we you. have a motion to second to approve. We do have that. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 So the future business, April 11th, regular Board of Trustees meeting, 5 o'clock. And we have the mayor's going to adjourn us. Um, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor.